A day that began with a class field trip ended with a parent's worst nightmare. Family and friends worked with local police and the FBI in an urgent search for a missing daughter. An unlikely suspect eventually emerged in the girl's disappearance. Faced with conflicting testimony, the FBI would need to rely on forensic evidence to convict a predator. Parents of 11-year-old Brittany Martinez knew their daughter was no runaway, but that was all they knew. Something had happened to her, something terrible. When they failed to find Brittany in their quiet Illinois neighborhood, they called the police. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. The FBI was soon brought in to grapple with conflicting witness reports, false leads, and a lack of clues. Agents wouldn't stop until they found Brittany and the truth. Chicago, Illinois and its surrounding suburbs are home to roughly 10 million residents of various backgrounds and income. People settled here to take advantage of Chicago's economic and cultural opportunities. Families from Chicago's nearby suburb of Elgin were no exception. At about 5 p.m. on May 8, 1997, Wendy Howlett returned to Elgin with her five-year-old son and her 11-year-old daughter, Brittany Martinez, after enjoying the day at Chicago's Shedd Aquarium. The mother of two had chaperoned her daughter's fifth grade class on a field trip to the famous institution. She was just all excited about her field trip to the Shedd Aquarium. And I had five of her girlfriends with me. They had a great time. They liked the sharks, the turtles. We had lunch outside, seen the boats, seen planes going by. Brittany just had a wonderful time. Brittany and her friends were eager to play outside on the first warm day of spring. The fifth grader was her mother's eldest from a previous marriage. While upstairs with her son, Wendy heard her daughter call up from the street. Brittany asked if she could go to a nearby park. I looked down the window and she was looking up and I said, no, you can't go, you know, because I thought she was maybe just going with one friend and she actually went with five and I'm like, okay, there's a group, you can go. Just be back by six o'clock. The park was only two blocks away. Her son was too young to go with them, so Wendy offered to take him to his Aunt Pam's new house for a short visit. Since Pam lived in the neighborhood, the walk would be brief. On the way out, Wendy left Brittany a note, then bumped into her downstairs neighbor. She told him that if he saw Brittany return before six o'clock, her daughter had two options, wait for her mother upstairs or come to her Aunt Pam's house alone. 45 minutes later, Wendy had returned from Pam's without seeing Brittany. She figured she was still at the park with her friends. Wendy fixed a quick meal for her son while she waited for her brother to pick her up for work. At about 20 after six, her husband, Scott Howlett, came home from his job. Scott would watch the kids when Wendy worked part-time in the evenings with her brother as a custodian. And he walked in and I said, well, I gotta go to work now. Brittany's at the park with her friends. And he looked at me and said, no, she's not. Her friends are outside. Wendy's heart sank. She went to the window to check with Brittany's friends. And they all looked up at me and said, she went on her bike to Aunt Pam's house to where you are. I said, well, I'm home. Did, have you seen her since? They're like, no. 
Brittany's friends said they'd returned from the park a little while ago. Wendy called her sister-in-law, Pam. Hey, Pam. You seen Brittany? No, no, I seen her in the park. About half an hour ago. But Brittany had not shown up yet. The family went off in search of her. It wasn't normal for Brittany not to call me. From like 6 to 6.30, I'd normally know where she's at. So that was unusual to begin with for my daughter not to be in contact with me. It also wasn't like Brittany to be out alone. In a few hours, it would be dark. My husband left to start searching on foot, thinking maybe she could have been at this park still, on the way to Aunt Pam's or something. We didn't know. When we didn't find her by like 8 o'clock, a mother's instinct, I knew there was a problem. Wendy called 911. Elgin patrol units were immediately dispatched. Sergeant Robert Beter of the Elgin Police Department was a detective at the time. He knew that when police respond quickly, they usually find the minor unharmed. Anytime we receive a phone call regarding a missing child, it's, we take it pretty seriously. Initially, we make contact with the people who call us. In every case, we normally search the residents, the person's residents, inside, uh, just in case, cover the bases in case the person is hiding under the bed or in the closet, and that's happened in the past. That wasn't the case with Brittany. Wendy told officers that her daughter was last seen wearing jeans, a blue T-shirt, yellow socks, and white sneakers. Police had to consider the possibility that Brittany had simply run away. They started asking me about my daughter, and they're like, well, are you sure she's not at a friend's house? I said, the friends she would have been at, they're right there. Um, they started asking me, are you sure she didn't run away? Was she angry? Was she mad? I'm like, no, she was, we had an awesome day all day. She was with her friends, and it's not like my daughter not to notify me this long. Investigators next questioned the Howlett's downstairs neighbor. He said that Brittany and her friends came back from the park at about 5.50, 20 minutes before Wendy had returned from her sister-in-law Pam's house. The neighbor said he gave Brittany the message from her mother. She could wait upstairs or go to her Aunt Pam's alone. According to him, Brittany seemed excited about going to see her aunt. Five minutes later, the 23-year-old neighbor said he was inside his apartment when he heard Brittany struggling to drag her bicycle up the basement stairs. He went out to give the 11-year-old a hand with her bike. Once they were on the street, Brittany thanked him and rode off toward her Aunt Pam's house. The neighbor never saw her after that. As word of Brittany's disappearance spread, more police and family members continued to gather to help in the search. At around nine o'clock, Wendy's younger brother, Eddie Milka, pulled up. Brittany's uncle was shocked by the news. He told his worried sisters that he had also seen Brittany outside the apartment at around six o'clock when he had stopped by to pick up Wendy for work. He'd gone to work alone when he learned Wendy wasn't home. Milka said he would go to search for his niece at the park. Investigators continued to question people who lived close by, hoping someone had seen something that could point them in the right direction. But no one else had seen the 11-year-old on her bike after she left her house. Neighbors were reporting no type of disturbance or any unusual activity in the neighborhood. It was a very nice day kids out playing. Uh, there was just no signs of, of her being taken from the scene by force. Um, so we were, we were very concerned. Brittany! The searchers fanned out in every possible direction the fifth grader could have wandered. Brittany! They began in the park where Brittany and her friends had been playing. Brittany! A helicopter joined overhead. 
Other volunteers searched dumpsters and alleys in the area. Brittany and her bicycle seemed to have disappeared without a trace. As the night wore on, the searchers straggled back, weary and discouraged. Wendy remained at home, hoping for news on her daughter's whereabouts. During that search, I wanted to go out and help search, and they advised me that I should stay home just in case she called, or maybe it could have been a ransom or whatever. So I stayed home as hard as it was, and no phone calls, no nothing. My husband, my mom, my sisters, they were all out searching here, going to parks. Um, they continued to search all night. Wendy did her best to remain composed. But after six hours of fruitless searching, the mother was distraught. She was very upset, uh, very emotional, uh, very concerned, just at wit's end, um, just didn't know where to turn. Uh, we tried to reassure her that, you know, we're doing everything we can. Uh, we're not going to give up on this. We're going to keep going and going and going until we find her. Once again, investigators turned their attention to the interior of the building for clues. In the basement, they were surprised to find Brittany's bike. The chain was unsecured. It wasn't like Brittany to leave it unlocked. So, you heard it? The bike was Brittany's prized possession. The neighbor told police he never saw Brittany return after she rode off. Investigators believe that the bike must have been returned before 6.20 when Scott Howlett, Brittany's stepfather, came home from work. Hoping for a lead, several officers returned to the station to search the database. Illinois state law requires that all convicted child molesters register with the local police. Investigators sought past offenders whose records might point to a likely suspect. Obviously, your number one concern would be if there's anybody in the area that would be, that could be prone to this type of behavior, taking a, a, a young child. So we, we naturally assume, let's cover the base with sex offenders. They discovered that a registered sex offender was known to reside a few blocks away from the missing girl's apartment. Local officers knew the man was currently homeless and lived in his van. They also knew where he usually parked at night. If the missing girl was inside, Investigators didn't want to provoke him to do anything desperate. Brittany was not there. Nothing inside indicated Brittany had ever been in the van. He claimed to have no knowledge of the missing girl and gave the detectives an account of his activities that day. His alibi checked out. No, thank you. Have a nice night. Officers re-interviewed family and friends in the slim hope that they might offer something new that could help. Wendy's parents, Brittany's maternal grandparents, lived a few miles away with their 20-year-old son, Eddie Milka. No one had seen Brittany since Eddie had at about 6 o'clock. The family believed Eddie was one of the last persons to see her. We wanted to find out further information that Brittany might have relayed to him that she was going somewhere, or maybe he dropped her somewhere or something, anything that he might have been able to tell us. Eddie Milka appeared tired, but detectives wanted to get a more detailed statement while his memory was still fresh. When police asked him to provide one back at the station, the missing girl's uncle was offended. He blurted out, why do you guys think I took Brittany? Um, we're kind of taken aback by that because it was an unusual statement. Um, it was, we, we weren't accusing him of anything, we are just asking for his help. Despite the offense and the late hour, Eddie agreed to talk to them at the station. Anything to help investigators locate Brittany. Come on, we'll take a look at your car. 
sure. He also allowed police to search the car he'd been driving what, to quell what whatever doing? suspicions they may have had. In that type of a search, you'd take a look and see if anything would, would uh, draw your attention to the car. Maybe some item of clothing that she was wearing at the time. Not that we expected to find that in there, but um, we need to explore all avenues. There was a garbage can in the back seat of the car. Uh, there was a vacuum cleaner in the trunk of the car. And it didn't surprise us because Wendy had told us that that's what they do. Uh, she and Eddie clean places um, at night, generally. Eddie accompanied the police to the station. Detectives hoped he'd have the answers they needed to find his missing niece. Brittany Martinez was still out there, somewhere. And investigators didn't know if she was dead or alive. In the early morning hours of May 9, 1997, Wendy Howlett's 11-year-old daughter, Brittany Martinez, had been missing from her Elgin, Illinois home for almost 11 hours. Extensive searches and interviews through the night had turned up no trace of the missing girl. Desperate, Wendy Howlett reached out to the community for help. We called the Polyclass organization. They sent us information and what to do and what procedures to follow to get her picture on the internet for those missing and exploited children. We started calling any of the news channels to see if they can get her picture on TV to see if someone maybe seen her. If one news station said no, we called the next one. Chicago morning news programs broadcast appeals to the public to be on the lookout for the brown-haired 11-year-old. Authorities set up a hotline, hoping for the call that would lead them to Brittany. Like many in the community, Elgin Police Detective Robert Beter was deeply troubled by the case. This investigation was particularly difficult because of uh, it involved a small child. She was 11 years old, and actually at the time, my son, my oldest son, was 11 years old, and it kind of hit home. Um, when you first get these cases, 99 times out of 100, you can find the person rather quickly. So as time goes on, it just, it just became very draining um, to try, try to determine where this person's at. Okay, Eddie, tell me what happened that evening. Racing I against time, to detectives turned to Brittany's uncle, Eddie Milka, for help. Although the 20-year-old janitor had been up all night, detectives asked him to detail what he could remember about the last time he saw his niece. He said that at around 6 p.m., he arrived to pick up Brittany's mother, Wendy, who was supposed to help him clean a building that night. Eddie recalled seeing his niece outside with her bike. He asked where her mother was. Brittany said that her mother was not home. Eddie couldn't wait for his sister. He had to be at work, so he said goodbye, hugged his niece, then left at around 6.15. He said he wasn't sure if Brittany had taken her bike inside afterwards. Cigarettes, and then I at about 6.45, Eddie stopped at a convenience store to buy a pack of cigarettes before work. He stayed at work until 8.30 and discovered that Brittany was missing at about 9. He had searched two parks that night where he knew Brittany often played. But like the rest of the family, he turned up nothing. Afterwards, he stopped by the house of some friends and admitted smoking marijuana okay, with them. Now he was exhausted and wanted to get some sleep. At some point in the interview, he said, listen, guys, you're just going to have to let me go because I don't have anything else to tell you. I'm tired. I want to go home. Um, and at this point, it was like a three-hour interview. And we didn't, have, we didn't have any reason to keep him there, so then we brought him home. With time working against him, Elgin police contacted the Chicago field office of the FBI. That was pretty recent. From experience, FBI Special Agent Beth Malarkey knew that if Brittany was not found in the first 24 hours, the girl's chances of survival were slim. The initial hours are incredibly crucial. We all know in law enforcement and having worked previous kidnapping cases that the longer the child goes missing, the less likelihood there is of recovering the child, certainly alive and our mission is to recover a live child. 
the FBI offered local authorities additional manpower, plus a computer system that helped organize cross-reference and manage leads. These resources became increasingly valuable as calls flooded in. There were hundreds of leads that were called in by the public because of a, a number that was disseminated to the public for anyone having information. All of those leads were cataloged and checked. People's alibis were checked. Investigators decided to follow up on Eddie Milka's alibi as well. They spoke to the president of the company whose building Eddie was scheduled to clean the night before. The executive had worked late that night and saw no one else in the building. When he locked up at 8.15, the president's car was the only one in the lot. Investigators also checked the convenience store where Milka said he bought cigarettes. The store was equipped with a 24-hour surveillance camera. The detective scanned the video recorded on May 8th from 6 to 8 p.m. He never saw Brittany's uncle enter the store. Eddie Milka had lied about his whereabouts. The other family members were interviewed, and what they told us turned out to be true. All their whereabouts were accounted for. Other people were, were able to verify their statements. Everything that Edward Milka told us turned out not to be true. But the discovery that Milka had lied did not prove wrongdoing nor did it put investigators any closer to finding the young girl. It had been almost 24 hours since Brittany was reported missing. Now, can I get a copy of investigators continued to pursue all viable leads. By this time, we were just getting continuous telephone leads, People, the citizens calling in, community calling in, assisting us with, with possible information. Maybe they saw her somewhere. Witnesses reported seeing Brittany in many locations throughout the region, including a restaurant. The police dispatched officers to check each sighting. The public and investigators alike clung to hope that Brittany was still alive. Each time officers responded, they were disappointed. Police found uh, only conflicting sure stories and unconfirmed yeah, accounts. Sure. Yeah. Where are they right here? By the end of the first day, investigators were forced to consider the possibility that they were no longer looking for a live victim. May 10, 1997, marked the second day that Elgin, Illinois police and the FBI searched for missing 11-year-old Brittany Martinez. Since Brittany had now been missing for over 36 hours, the possibility that she had met a violent end became more likely. The last person to have seen her was her uncle, Eddie Milka. Elgin detective Robert Beter could not eliminate Milka as a suspect. Eddie Milka was always a question. It was always a question on his behavior. It was always a question on his statements that he told us. And all the other leads that we were getting in, they were quickly, quickly resolved. But no one had seen Milka talking to Brittany outside her home, as Milka himself had claimed. Thanks. Elgin police detective Brian Gorkowski realized that unless Brittany or her body was recovered, investigators had no physical evidence that she'd been harmed. We suspected that this was a kidnapping maybe at some point or a child abduction, but again, we had no tangible things to say, you know, this is a murder. We had no body. We had no smoking gun, if you will. That was very difficult for me. On the morning of May 10th, Detective Gorkowski received a page from Brittany's mother, Wendy. She said that her brother, Eddie Milka, wanted to talk to police again. We wanted to re-interview Eddie Milka. We wanted him to come in and talk to us voluntarily. And if he did do that, we wanted as much information about his background, his past, as we could gather. So we were very pleased that she did give us this background. Wendy Howlett described Eddie as slow. He had attended a special high school for the learning disabled. As far as she knew, Eddie had few friends and no girlfriends. Investigators met with the 20-year-old in the police department's family interview room. You all right? Okay, yes. They asked him what he wanted to tell them. 
The detectives were pleased by Eddie Milka's response. Milka told us he had lied. I mean, initially, right off the bat in, in the beginning of this conversation, and that he was now going to tell us the truth. Well, at that point, I got a little excited because I like when someone I'm going to interview tells me they lied. Because that, at that point, I know that we can get everything behind us. We can start getting the truth out. We can be open. There can be some honest dialogue between the two of us. He admitted that when he saw Brittany, he was under the influence of marijuana. But he maintained that he had left his niece in front of her apartment at about 6.15 when he drove off to work. Milka told detectives that when he pulled into work, he saw his boss's car and wanted to avoid him since he was high. He claimed that he didn't enter the office building until 8.15 when his boss left. Detectives knew this version couldn't be true. We confronted him with the workplace lie. You weren't in the workplace at 8.15 p.m. We know that because the owner said there was no one inside that business when he had left. Milko told us, you know, you, you might be right. Um, there may be some time difference here. But Milka didn't elaborate. If he knew where Brittany was, he wasn't forthcoming. Investigators tried a new tack. I asked him to imagine where Brittany was at this point in time because he was the last one to see her. He began to rub his temples, he closed his eyes, and then he said she was in Elgin, then she was near Elgin, that she was cold and wet. He continued to reiterate that constantly. We asked if she was breathing, he said that she was not. We asked if she was bleeding, he told us no, she wasn't bleeding. Milka asked for a cigarette. He started pacing and mumbling, then asked the detective to write down what he was about to say. Milka claimed he was having a vision of Brittany in an old gray car with two men who were drinking beer. He also saw farmhouses, a dirt road, gravel, rocks, and a creek. He added that the men had touched her all over but he didn't stop there. After he had told me that he had seen these two uh, males touching Brittany, he then told me, I know she's dead, I wanna tell my sister she's dead, grabbed me, hugged me, and began to cry. Eddie? Wendy Howard was called down to the station. She noticed her brother had been crying and asked what he had to tell her. Once again, Eddie Milka changed his story. He just looked up at me and said, I didn't do it. I don't, you know, they're putting things in my head. I just want to go home. I just want to go home. They're telling me Brittany's dead. Brittany's still alive. We got to find her. Since Milka never admitted any wrongdoing in his vision statement, police had nothing to hold him on. Wendy took her brother home. Investigators questioned the two friends Milka said he had smoked marijuana with on the day Brittany disappeared. They confirmed that they'd been with Eddie until 10 minutes to 6 when he left for work. Milka told them that he would be back later to watch the Bulls game. When he returned at approximately 10.30 that night, Milka was upset and crying. He told them that his niece, Brittany, was missing. They then drank a few beers and watched the rest of the Bulls game. Eddie left their house at about 1 AM. The friends had nothing more to add. Investigators still had no evidence that Milka had abducted Brittany and no clue as to where she might be now. And then, you know, a week goes by and we still haven't determine what happened to her. She could have been fined somewhere. She could have been taken and then released. And that's how some of these cases work out. Some of the more, uh, the more dangerous ones, the person takes them and then releases them at a later time. On May 17th, 1997, 
nine days after Brittany disappeared. A couple was boating on the Kishwaukee River, 18 miles outside of Elgin, when they made a grisly discovery. They found the body of a girl washed up on a sandbar. She was naked from the waist up and severely decomposed. The terrified couple made for shore and then ran to call the police. On May 17, 1997, nine days after 11-year-old Brittany Martinez was reported missing from her Elgin, Illinois home, a young girl's body was discovered 18 miles away in the Kishwaukee River. Lieutenant Jean Lowry of the McHenry County Sheriff's Department investigated. At the time, we weren't sure if it was Brittany Martinez or not. I knew from screening the missing cases that come through our jurisdiction at the Sheriff's Department, we didn't have any missing females that would be within that age range. So we begin to look outside of our jurisdiction and other, other police agencies to determine what, if any, missing persons might fit that description. The nearby Elgin police and FBI were called in to determine if the dead girl was Brittany. FBI Special Agent Beth Malarkey believed they had finally found her. Those of us who were involved in the investigation and knew the description of Brittany, what she looked like, what her hair looked like, the clothes that she was wearing when she was missing, although the body that was found on the sandbar was missing a t-shirt, the rest of it very much resembled Brittany Martinez, the dark hair, the blue jeans, the socks, and the tennis shoes that she was wearing. It was impossible to visually identify the victim or to immediately determine how she had died. Investigators could see no external wounds. They believed she had likely been killed elsewhere than dumped in the river. The mood amongst the investigators was grim. It just became very sad because the reality of having a dead child and the investigating the investigation changing from a missing child to possibly a murdered child um, changed the whole tone of the investigation. The surrounding area struck Detective Brian Gorkowski as similar to the place Eddie Milka had described earlier in his vision statement. The scene of the Kishwaukee River at that point seems more like a creek or a small body of water, not necessarily what you would picture a river to be. There were rocks, there was dirt roads in the area, there was farmhouses. The landscape very much uh, depicted what Eddie had told me in the vision statement. To confirm that Milka's vision statement was not a coincidence, they needed proof that could link him to this location. The FBI's evidence recovery team, specialists in crime scene forensics, were called in. It was the same unit that sifted through the debris of Pan Am Flight 103 and the Oklahoma City bombing. The ERT is very highly trained and professional and organized in how they conduct crime scene searches. And because this looked like a murder investigation at this point, every piece of evidence was going to be extremely important. The forensic technicians took soil, water, and plant samples as well as samples of the insects that had colonized the body. Based on the development of these larvae, scientists determined that the victim died no later than 2 p.m. on May 9th, the day after Brittany disappeared. That night, Wendy Howlett prayed it wasn't Brittany. I still was trying to keep hope that it wasn't my daughter and I was hoping it was no one else. It was someone's little girl, but I was hoping it wasn't mine. Two days later, dental records confirmed that the remains were, in fact, those of Brittany Martinez. A forensic pathologist determined that she had died of asphyxiation. Two strips of tape were removed from her face and mouth. A large bruise with scalloped edges was found on her cheek. To investigators, it resembled a bite mark. The examiner noted that Whitney's jeans were only half zipped and her underwear was on inside out. 
he found two lacerations on the hymen. The pathologist concluded that the fifth grader had been sexually assaulted immediately before or at the time of her death. It would take several more months to process Brittany's clothing and tissue samples at the FBI lab. Special Agent Malarkey wanted to make sure that the analysis was thorough. I have to say that I didn't sleep for several days after that because seeing her, seeing the state that she was in, and understanding the magnitude of what took place. Detective Robert Beter hoped the discovery of Brittany's body and clothing would provide the physical evidence they needed to catch her killer. When it was final, at that point we could notify the families and, and really start digging our heels and focusing on uh, some of the evidence we had already recovered. For the past 11 days, Wendy Howlett had nourished the hope that her child was still alive. Now, that hope was dashed. The Howlett's worst fears had come true. When they told me that it was my daughter, it is the worst feeling that you ever want to know. I can't even describe the pain that it goes through because that was my only girl. And I wish this upon no one, not even my worst enemy do I wish this upon. And like an hour after my daughter, they confirmed that it was her, I went into her room and started breaking things. And then I got even more upset because I was breaking her things and I still was hoping she was alive even though I knew she wasn't. Investigators speculated on why Brittany's body had come to rest in a river 18 miles from her home. Lieutenant Jean Lowry asked Brittany's mother if the location seemed significant. And at that time, she had indicated that her father was an employee of the Milwaukee Railroad and had since been retired or disabled, and the family spent many summers at the Railroad Museum in Union, Illinois, a very, very short distance from where Brittany Martinez's body was found. Eddie Milka had spent time there as well. Investigators secured a warrant for samples of his blood, saliva, and hair. They were forwarded to the FBI lab so examiners could begin the lengthy work of DNA mapping. Milka's genetic profile would be ready for comparison to any foreign DNA recovered from Brittany or her clothing. A forensic dentist also took impressions of Milka's teeth. Investigators suspected the mold would match the bite mark found on Brittany's cheek. The dentist compared the cast to a blown up photo of the indentations on the victim's face. The two appeared to match. But due to advanced decomposition, the bite mark was distorted, so the dentist could not be absolutely certain Milka's teeth had made the mark. The results were inconclusive. Authorities still lacked the physical evidence needed to make an arrest. They obtained a warrant to search the impounded Lincoln Town car they believed Milka had used to drive Brittany to the river. Soil samples collected from the wheel wells were found to be too common to prove where the car had been. Investigators hoped something on the inside would be more promising. Among the clutter in the back seat, agents found a paper cup from a fast food restaurant. Its lid was stained red with what appeared to be blood. The lid also held a partial palm print that matched Eddie Milka's. Brittany's fingerprint, along with her mother's, were found as well. Matted in the fibers of the backseat floor mat, they found more red stains. Agents secured samples of fibers from the floor mat and upholstery. More than 140 items were collected from the car and forwarded to the growing caseload at the FBI lab. Since the lab would take months to complete tests, 
Lieutenant Lowry asked Brittany's relatives to recall if anyone had been injured inside the car. Brittany's maternal grandmother, Milka, remembered that the 11-year-old had had a nosebleed in the car on the day of a family outing. Brittany's other grandmother said she was also there that day, but did not recall the incident. The Milka family painted it as, yes, there was a bloody nose in the vehicle, and these circumstances occurred. The other side of the family painted a dramatically different picture, that there was absolutely no evidence of a bloody nose. Family members on the two sides were lining up against each other. The Milkas believed that Eddie could not have killed Brittany. The hardest part of this investigation is the fact that our suspect was a family member. That obviously causes family problems when you suspect another family member of being the suspect in a case. That became difficult to overcome because we wanted the family's cooperation and it's difficult for the family to keep cooperating when one of their own becomes a suspect. Though circumstantial evidence pointed to Eddie Milka, contradictory stories and no confirmed physical evidence meant that investigators might never be able to charge Brittany's uncle with her murder. By early December 1997, Six and a half months had passed since the body of 11-year-old Brittany Martinez was discovered in a river 18 miles from her home. Her uncle, 20-year-old Eddie Milka, was the prime suspect and agreed to provide tissue samples, though his side of the family believed he was not responsible. Without substantial physical evidence, it would be difficult for the FBI and local investigators to charge him with murder. Examiners at the FBI crime lab in Washington, D.C. had spent months sifting through hundreds of pieces of trace evidence collected during the investigation. Karen Lanning, a scientist in the FBI's trace evidence unit, received Brittany's clothing and coordinated the examination. The evidence was processed in one of our scraping rooms, which is a room where we put the ev items of evidence, victims and suspects are kept separately, items from a scene are in a separate room so that we're not contaminating anything. Lanning examined Brittany's socks, underwear, and jeans. Each item was scraped in the search for hairs or fibers foreign to the clothing. On the inside of the jeans, the examiner discovered one thin nylon fiber, a fiber distinctly different from the denim. She would compare the question fiber to a known sample from the carpet in Milka's car. The fibers matched. In four additional tests, her results were the same. Investigators theorized that Brittany had been in Milka's car with her jeans removed since the carpet fiber was found inside of her jeans. But the fiber match alone was not enough to prove the theory since that type of fiber was common to many cars. I couldn't say that the fiber came from that carpeting as opposed to another carpeting just like it. So if there were two cars um, that were the same, I can't say it's from car A versus car B. Investigators hoped the remaining evidence would prove more conclusive. Special Agent Melissa Smurf, okay. chief of the mitochondrial okay. DNA unit two at the FBI laboratory, okay. was a serology and nuclear DNA examiner at the time. It was her task to determine if any of the victims or suspects' fluids were present on the evidence. She found Brittany's clothing okay. too contaminated Thanks to test. Brittany had been dead for approximately nine days before she was found. Because of that, she had started to decompose, and the clothing that she had on her showed evidence of that decomposition. Agent Smurz instead focused on the red stains found on the fast food cup and carpet taken from Milka's car. She determined that the stains were human blood. Through DNA testing, she'd find out whose. The examiner compared known samples of Eddie Milka's and Brittany's DNA to that found on the cup and carpet. 
Agent Smurz concluded that the blood in the car had come from Brittany. The probability that someone else had bled on the cup was at least 6.4 million to one. It was enough to issue a warrant for Eddie Milka's arrest. On December 18th, 1997, over seven months after Brittany disappeared, Eddie Milka was charged with murder, aggravated kidnapping, and predatory criminal assault of a child. His arrest took his sister, Wendy Howlett, by surprise. I not only lost my daughter, I am now losing my brother to something I know he didn't do. And I was more stunned and in shock than anything that, you know, this can't be happening. This, this nightmare has got to end somewhere. In order to protect her brother, Wendy Howlett said that it was unlikely that Eddie would have driven to the river in McHenry County since he had never been there before. She told Lieutenant Jean Lowry that the railroad museum the Milkas went to as kids was not in that area as she had previously stated. Wendy began to change her story for whatever reason and backed off on that statement that again forced us to re-interview her and try and determine, you know, where she was in regard to that statement because it, it would be key in determining what the connection was to McHenry County. James McAuliffe from McHenry County State's Attorney's Office knew the trial would be difficult. Two of the key witnesses, Eddie's sister Wendy and Eddie's mother, would testify on the suspect's behalf. I have those expert reports. We had to impeach some very sympathetic people for whom our hearts went out, but we had no alternative because they had changed their story so much. So we had to, in effect, attack our own witnesses and members of the family who had suffered such a terrible loss. It made it extremely difficult for us. It made it extremely difficult for the Milka and Hallett family and all the members who testified. On April 21st, 2000, nearly three years after Brittany's death, the case of the state versus Edward Milka went to trial. The prosecution called more than 50 witnesses. In closing arguments, prosecutors told the jury how they believed the murder had taken place. They believed Eddie Milka had helped Brittany return her bike to the basement. In her haste, she left it unlocked, but took the cup she'd carried since coming home from her field trip. In the past, Brittany had sometimes accompanied her mother and uncle on cleaning jobs to help pay for the bike she loved so much. The prosecution believed Eddie drove to a nearby forest preserve after he saw his boss's car parked at work. There, prosecutors contended, he sexually assaulted his niece and likely smothered her until she died, then dumped her body in the Kishwaukee River. The defendant, Edward Milka. The jury was not convinced Eddie Milka had planned to kill Brittany. When the jury retired and they came back, they entered a finding of not guilty on the first degree murder. They felt that he had not intentionally murdered his niece. Felony murder. On the second charge of murder while in commission of a felony sexual assault, the jury found Edward Milka guilty. Many investigators, including Lieutenant Lowry, sympathized with Wendy Howlett's loss. The verdict provided little comfort to her family. This is a tragedy, a human tragedy. There's no other way to cut it. As a father, I can tell you, if I had to experience this, I don't know if I could survive it. So for her as a mother, my heart goes out to her. Edward Milka was sentenced to 75 years in the Illinois Department of Corrections. His crime tore a close family apart. When young Brittany was killed, no one could hear her scream. But with the FBI's forensic experts on the trail, the story of Brittany's final hours could be told. And her killer brought to justice. A bank is robbed. There are no witnesses. Its president is missing without a trace. When a body surfaced, the criminal investigation grew deadly serious.
federal agents descended upon a small town that found itself gripped by fear. The small community of Nome, Missouri discovered their bank was robbed, they were shocked. When the bank president turned up missing, they were outraged. But things aren't always as they first appear. And when clues began to surface, the facts were more terrible than anyone could have guessed. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. For federal agents, the Noel bank robbery became an intricate case in modern forensics and dogged determination. The Cowskin Bridge over Grand Lake, Oklahoma, just after 3 a.m. The lake is popular for fishing and boating. But on this night, it would be the scene of something far more sinister. A gruesome crime, meticulously planned and executed. A cold-blooded murder that would shatter the tranquility of the nearby town of Noel, Missouri. No! 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 Tucked away in the southwest corner of Missouri and home to about 1,200 residents, Noel is a community proud of its small town charms and low crime rate. On the morning of October 6, 1989, Pauline Coonrod headed off to work at the State Bank of Noel. The cashier's first task upon arriving was to unlock the front doors. but Coonrod found the doors already open. She thought perhaps the bank president, Dan Short, had arrived early. But as she walked through the building, she saw no one. Within moments, Coonrod realized the vault had been robbed. Noel police and the McDonald County, Missouri Sheriff responded to Coonrod's 911 call. The FBI was also called in since the bank was insured by the FDIC, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. An agent was sent to investigate from the nearby Joplin, Missouri office. The entire scene was meticulously photographed and dusted for prints. The agent noticed that the security camera had been spray painted and shot out. Spent casings found below the camera indicated that the robbers used a 45 caliber handgun. Investigators discovered that the thieves had made off with over $71,000, including 320 pounds of quarters, dimes, and nickels. We also keep some money here. Strangely, more than $100,000 in bills was left behind in an unlocked drawer. Bank President Dan Short was one of four bank employees with access to the vault and its time lock. Yet he was the only one of the four who hadn't arrived that morning. Questioning him became essential to the investigation. Bank Vice President Mark Allman told investigators that Short intended to work late the night before. The time lock on the vault um, hadn't been set the night that the robbery occurred. Um, Dan had came in was, and was in the habit of working later in the evenings at different times during the week, but uh, um, that particular night he'd put it on standby 
so that he could come back at a later time and, and open the vault manually. Agents wondered if Dan Short had in fact returned to the bank that evening. The sheriff drove to Short's house in Arkansas near the Missouri border. But no one was home and his red pickup truck was gone. Short's absence alarmed investigators. They couldn't help but wonder what role the banker played in the robbery. Within hours, word of the crime spread throughout the scandalized community. Knoll's a small town, main industries, poultry processing plants, some small shops, local merchants, um, quiet town, tourism in the summertime with the rivers, that sort of thing, but uh, basically just your average small town. Crimes like this did not happen here. Reports of the heist and the missing bank president filled Knoll news broadcasts. Investigators received many calls from the community offering help. One call from an employee at Sibley Manufacturing just outside of town gave investigators their first break. He reported a red pickup truck abandoned in the factory parking lot. The truck was registered to Dan Short. Investigators found coin wrappers strewn across the truck bed. The truck was dusted for fingerprints, but only shorts were identified. The discovery of the truck gave case agent and 19-year FBI veteran Liddell Farley a couple of scenarios to pursue. At the end of the first day, we weren't sure if we were dealing with, with an abducted banker or whether the banker, Mr. Short, had absconded with the money. Stops were being placed with his credit card. Airports were being canvassed. A rental car agencies were being checked to see if he perhaps had leased a car. But primarily, we're looking for his body, either alive or dead, in the immediate area of Noel. With Short still missing, investigators secured a search warrant for the bank president's house, hey, hoping to find something that would lead to his whereabouts. Stay place. Anybody home? Mr. Short. Inside, all was quiet. Trooper, look here a minute. In the kitchen, they discovered an overturned trash can, suggesting perhaps a struggle. searched every room. Hi, come here a minute. By the bed, they found Short's glasses on the nightstand. He never went anywhere without them. Let's get some light on in here. Right. I think that you're still it appeared that the banker had left in a hurry. Uh, I'd say he declared his yeah, like what, Still, it was impossible to determine from the search whether he had fled or was abducted. With no sign of short, agents canvassed his neighborhood, hoping for a lead. One neighbor, Carol Dryden, recalled seeing several vehicles pulling into Short's driveway the night of the robbery. Assistant U.S. Attorney Mike Jones was involved early in the investigation. According to Jones, Dryden's statement was critical. Around 2 o'clock in the morning, which really gave us the first time frame, uh, she saw lights uh, going into Dan Shard's property, headlights, and then about 15 or 20 minutes later, uh, going out of uh, Dan Shard's driveway. But the neighbor's statement didn't put the FBI any closer to finding Short. McDonald County Sheriff Don Schlesman was a lead investigator in the case and coordinated the massive search for the banker in the area surrounding Knoll. We set up a command post on the west side of Knoll. The groups were split up, giving roads to walk down. Highway Patrol had their helicopter down. We had airplanes. Just mainly did a search from the air and ground. Beginning from the location where Short's truck was found, search teams proceeded outwards in concentric circles, 
hoping to find a trace of Short in the immediate vicinity. Five days after the crime, there was still no trace of the bank president. As the hunt expanded, Farley and 22 agents from the Kansas City office formed a task force with local law enforcement. To house the large number of personnel, the FBI set up headquarters of the local armory. While they unpacked, leads came pouring in from concerned residents. One tip came from local truck driver Buddy Mills. Having heard about the heist, Mills told an agent about what he saw on a road in Knoll the morning of the robbery. Returning home from work at about 3 a.m., he encountered three vehicles leaving town. One truck matched the description of Short's red pickup. It headed off with a two-toned van. The other dark-colored truck followed Mills for a while until it turned down a road toward neighboring Arkansas. This information jibed with Carol Dryden's recollection of the traffic outside of Short's house at 2 a.m. Mills' account reinforced the time frame for the crime. Farley met with the bank president's ex-wife, Joyce, who had been married to Short for 25 years. Although they had recently separated, Joyce stressed he was a loving father to their two children. Having worked closely with him at the bank for several years, she never witnessed any impropriety. Yet Short was the FBI's only suspect right now. And after several days of searching, he was still missing. On October 11th, a couple fishing in Grand Lake, just over the state line in Oklahoma, hunted for a good spot to drop a line. They motored to a favorite shady spot. Hoping to hook some bass, they sighted what looked like a clump of seaweed floating on the water. Moving closer, they made a gruesome discovery. Just under the surface, they saw the head and arms of a submerged body. Five days after the robbery of the State Bank of Knoll, Missouri, a dead body surfaced. Two employees of the marina towed it to a dock. The body was badly decomposed, but the coroner determined that the man had been dead for five days. Immediately after death, bacteria begin to break down the soft tissues of the organs, releasing gaseous compounds. After a few days, the gas fills the corpse and can lift the submerged body to the surface. Sheriff Don Schlesman recalled the bloated remains lifted additional weight from the bottom of the lake. He had the chain tied to him and a concrete block and part of the chair. And uh, it was a pretty gruesome sight, really. A corpse will float until the skin tears, releasing the gases. Then the body will sink back to the bottom. If the boaters hadn't seen the body that day, it may have never been found. The time of death was later determined to be consistent with the time frame of Dan Short's disappearance. The sheriff found a wallet in the victim's back pocket. Inside was a driver's license confirming the identity as Dan Short. The sheriff contacted the FBI. The search for 51-year-old Dan Short was over and a homicide investigation had begun. With his surfacing, which was almost in defiance of the people who had murdered him, it gave us the knowledge of what had happened and it gave us the focus that we needed in the investigation to direct resources thereafter. Farley and his partner Larry Nolan rushed to the lake to conduct their own review of the body. Special Agent Nolan's first task was to preserve the evidence. Collectively, the decision was made to release Mr. Short from the chair, at which time I uh, 
uh, released him and preserved the concrete block and the chain hoist, uh, the chair, and also the duct tape. Okay, guys. With Short's corpse freed from his death trap, the coroner removed the body. The medical examiner determined the probable cause of death was drowning. The chair with the block, chain hoist, and duct tape were examined and photographed by investigators before being sent to the FBI lab in Washington, D.C. The task force set up a hotline and published pictures of the chair to alert the public, hoping someone would come forward with information. It was clear from examining the chair and uh, the apparatus, so to speak, that was attached to it, and the location of Mr. Short's body, that he had died a horrible death. All indications are that he was conscious when he was dropped from the bridge some 30 feet to the water. The hotline was inundated with calls, helping build a file of more than 80 suspects. According to Sheriff Don Schlesman, one promising tip came from an anonymous caller who urged investigators to question two brothers, Joe and Shannon Agofsky. The Chicago Police Department dispatch received an anonymous call from someone that said the Agofskys had a lot of change in their possession, and a lot of change was what was taken from the bank. The FBI tracked down 23-year-old Joe Agofsky at a junkyard just south of Noel. The manager pointed agents to where Joe worked on his car. Yeah, sure. He's, uh, he's working right out there in that yard right there. Well, that's him right there in the black vest? Yeah. OK, thank you. How are you doing? Are you Joe Ogoski? Yes, sir. Joe said that on the night of the robbery, he had been at his girlfriend's house more than 40 miles from Noel. Is she available, and does she live locally here? Yes, sir. OK, very good. Uh, we're also interested in uh, 45 handguns. Do you have he was cooperative and told them he had two 45 caliber handguns. Could, could we see it? The same caliber as the weapon used to shoot out the security camera. They inquired if they could test fire the guns. Joe agreed and told investigators the weapons were stored at his home. His 18-year-old brother, Shannon, would be there to meet them. And your brothers, is this? It's in that room. When the agents arrived, Shannon Agofsky showed them where the guns were kept. Shannon told investigators that on the night of the murder, he was at his mother's house, where he was still living at the time of the crime. All right. All right. Um, it's going to be all right if we take these downtown? After firing both guns, agents sent the shell casings to the FBI lab. Examiners there would later determine that they did not match those found at the bank. To lead Agent Farley, it was a dead end. Both expressed their willingness to help the investigation if they could. Both had uh, alibis for the evening of the crime. Given these factors, our attention was directed elsewhere with other suspects uh, as both the Agofsky brothers appeared to be not involved in this crime. Back at Grand Lake in Oklahoma, where Short's body had been recovered two days earlier, resident Rowdy Foreman was out fishing with his son and daughter when he made a curious discovery along the shore. We came across a wooden dowel a brace, if you want to call it that, um, and it was just, it was just out of place. Alongside the chair part, Foreman also found a piece of duct tape. Having seen pictures in the newspaper, he believed it may have been from the chair found with Short's body. He sent his son to fetch plastic bags from his house in order to preserve his find. Sheriff Don Schlesman and a partner drove to Oklahoma to question Foreman about the discovery. And they asked me, said, do you have a piece of evidence? I told him, I said, I don't know if it's evidence. I said, uh, I found a piece of duct tape. And his first comment was, oh my God. 
it's that pretty. And they were looking at the fingerprint. Just clear as day, it was a print there. The fingerprint appeared to be made from car grease, impervious to the lake water. But investigators still had to prove the tape was used in the crime. Although the tape contained fingerprints, that piece of evidence was not relevant unless it could be proven to be part of the chair or the apparatus in which Mr. Short was drowned. To prove that, FBI examiners would have to match the glue and strands from the torn piece of tape with the tape found on the chair. But that would take weeks. Until then, the FBI and local investigators still had no prime suspects for the crime. A week after the robbery of the State Bank of Knoll, Missouri, and the brutal murder of its president, Dan Short, the FBI had recovered Short's body, the murder device, and a possible fingerprint from a nearby lake. Investigators fielded calls from residents who were willing to help, but also afraid to do so. Due to the manner in which Mr. Short was killed, although the local citizens were very concerned and wanted to be helpful, some were reluctant to do so out of fear. Therefore, some of the witnesses did not come forth. They did so sometimes out of the insistence of a friend or an associate. Farley received one such call from a man who claimed his friend might have information about the chain hoist wrapped around the chair that drowned Dan Short. The friend's name was Wayne Boutain. Boutain owned the chain hoist, which had recently been stolen. Though he notified the police, the hoist was never recovered. He suspected the Agofskis of stealing it. Farley showed Boutain the photos of the hoist investigators had retrieved from the lake. Boutain identified it as his own. He recognized damage on the pulley. He'd last seen the apparatus at Sheila Agofsky's house where he'd once lived. Boutain agreed to take a polygraph test and passed it. Another important development in the case was the determination that the chain hoist, which was duct taped to the chair, was property of Wayne Boutain, who had left it at the residence of Sheila Gofsky a few days before the murder of Mr. Short. On the strength of Boutain's statement, Farley decided to question the Agofskis again. Driving up to their mother's house, he noticed an old van in the front yard. It closely matched the description of one of the vehicles Buddy Mills saw the night of the bank heist. Farley questioned Sheila about the missing chain hoist, but she claimed to have no memory of it. She also corroborated Shannon's alibi, saying he was at her house the night of the murder. I don't know anything about it. I have no idea. Okay. I can't help you with anything. I appreciate your time. We'll be back in touch. Farley left with suspicions that she knew more than she was telling. He asked the brothers to give their fingerprints, hoping to match the one found on the duct tape. Joe Agofsky complied. When asked about the hoist, he told Farley he remembered seeing it at his mother's house. Yet he didn't know what became of it. A few days later, Farley returned to Sheila Agofsky's. I'm Special Agent Farley. There he found Shannon with a friend by the name of Gant Sanders. Having secured Joe's fingerprints, Farley tried to convince Shannon to give his as well. A set of his fingerprints. It'd make things a lot easier. 
possibly get you out of some trouble. Joe Ogowski was very cooperative and produced his fingerprints uh, upon request without hesitation, while Shannon was evasive and hesitant to. Gant Sanders watched cautiously. Shannon echoed his mother's story, proclaiming he had no knowledge of the chain heist. He eventually promised Farley he'd come down to the police station to give his prints, but he never showed. Although Farley had initially dismissed the Agovskis as suspects, he took note that Shannon and Joe's memories of the chain hoist were conflicting. Now, he decided to take a closer look into their background. Researching the family's financial records, Farley discovered that nine years earlier, they had received money from an insurance settlement after their father died in a plane crash. Popular opinion was that their money was still plentiful making them unlikely candidates for bank robbers. But Farley learned that wasn't so. While they had all received a considerable sum of money, as of that time, Joe had spent his. Their mother had spent a large portion of hers. And Shannon Nagoski had a considerable amount of money still in a fund, but it was not available to him at that time until he was 21. Agents found that both brothers had recently purchased cars with cash, yet neither had jobs. Investigators also determined that 18-year-old Shannon had spent more than $5,000 since the heist. Although the Agofsky brothers' spending looked suspicious, Farley still had no solid evidence linking them to the bank robbery and murder. Revisiting crime reports and witness statements, he made a new connection. Truck driver Buddy Mills said he had seen three vehicles leaving Noel on the night of the robbery. That meant there was a possible third suspect out there. If two of the vehicles were driven by the Agofsky brothers, then perhaps the other was driven by one of their friends. Farley recalled the young man he met briefly on the Agofsky's porch the day he questioned Shannon, Gant Sanders. Sanders had recently become Shannon's roommate. Farley tracked him down at a junkyard. The closest associate that we could identify of both Shannon and Joe Agofsky was Gant Sanders. It was learned that Gant had been good friends with both Joe and Shannon, both prior to and after the robbery and murder. But Sanders said he knew nothing about the robbery and murder, although he offered no alibi for the night in question. Farley decided to question Shannon again, this time with a polygraph machine. A couple of things about the test is nothing will be painful. The test was administered in a motel room by a technician from the Missouri capital of Springfield. A polygraph is used by investigators as a tool to rule out possible suspects. The machine monitors the subject's reactions to stress in three ways. Tubes fastened around the chest monitor the slightest change in respiration. Low voltage electrodes placed on the finger detect moisture on the skin. All right, relax your arms and a cuff on the arm measures changes in blood pressure. The examination is based on the body's fight or flight principle. When the brain perceives a physical or psychological threat, the body responds by increasing blood pressure, heart rate, and respiration. Shannon Nagofsky was asked about Dan Short, the robbery, and the murder. Did you take a chain hoist from Wayne Butane's? No. Did you kill Dan Short? No. Based on his physiological responses, the examiner determined that the younger Agofsky brother was deceptive about his knowledge of the crime. It was clear to Farley that Shannon was somehow involved. You do. But he'd need more convincing evidence to bring charges. Figure out what's best for yourself. 
In December 1989, the Agofskis were subpoenaed to appear before a grand jury to answer questions under oath. Each family member gave testimony separately. Shannon, Joe, and Sheila each disavowed any knowledge of the bank robbery and the murder of Dan Short. After questioning, Shannon was once again asked to supply his fingerprints voluntarily. Again, he agreed and set an appointment. In Washington, D.C., FBI analysts continued to examine the items sent to them by the agents in Knoll, trying to match the chair part and tape retrieved by Foreman to the chair and tape that had been bound to Dan Short. An examiner confirmed that the wood found by Rowdy Foreman was part of the same chair that Dan Short was taped to. The piece of tape with the fingerprint on it was the most promising piece of evidence. But did it match the tape used on the chair and body? It did. Examiners were conclusively able to link these portions of tape by matching the torn ends, the fibers, and the glue. The tape found by Foreman had two complete prints on it. They compared the prints to Joe Agofsky's, but they did not match. Farley recalled this finding was not all bad news. The fingerprint examiner notified me that the prints on the tape were similar to that of Joe Agofsky, but not identical. And he advised me that the fingerprints of siblings were often similar in pattern. Therefore, the getting the fingerprints of Shannon Nagowski was imperative. Although he told the grand jury he would provide his fingerprints, Shannon never did. But this time, Farley would force Shannon to comply by serving him with a subpoena. Grudgingly, Shannon Nagowski gave his prints to the FBI almost five months after the heist and murder. Since comparing his prints to those found on the tape would take several weeks, Shannon was free to go. But Agent Farley did not remain idle. He knew that Gant Sanders was close to both brothers and probably knew more about the crime than he had said. So he decided to confront him. He told Sanders that if he was innocent and had knowledge of the crime, he should cooperate with the investigation. But if Sanders was knowingly protecting the Rogovskis and they were convicted of the robbery and murder, Sanders would be jailed for aiding and abetting. Worse, without a solid alibi, he was still under suspicion of the crime. But Sanders revealed nothing. He remained faithful to the brothers. Farley thought that perhaps Sanders was hiding his guilt with his silence. Agent Farley pursued two brothers, Joe and Shannon Agofsky, as the prime suspects in the bank heist Hello. and murder. Joe's fingerprints had been compared to the me. two found on the duct tape from the murder device. His did not, not match. match no. As investigators waited for results Thanks. on a comparison with Shannon's, additional partial prints were discovered on the tape. Now the FBI needed new prints from Shannon, a 360 degree view to match the partial prints on the duct tape. But Shannon was nowhere to be found. Farley hoped that he could get to Shannon through one of the Agofsky brothers' friends, Gant Sanders. The agent also suspected Sanders could be the unidentified accomplice. But cooperating with the FBI would mean betraying his longtime friends. Finally, in June of 1990, hoping to clear his name, he contacted Farley, wanting to talk. Investigators told Sanders they thought that he had helped commit the bank robbery and murder in Knoll with the Agofsky brothers. 
but Sanders claimed he had nothing to do with the crime. However, he did admit to his involvement in another more recent incident. On one particular evening in late December 1989, Shannon and Joe Agofsky broke into a house in Missouri and stole several rifles. The brothers rendezvoused with Sanders later that evening, setting the second part of their plan into action. The next day, Sanders and Shannon drove across the state line into Arkansas and sold the guns. It was a federal violation. Sanders recalled another time when the brothers tried to convince him to participate in another, more violent crime just months after Dan Short's murder. Sheriff Don Schlesman recalled how the Agofskis tried to recruit Sanders. And they told him, hey, we're, uh, we're not doing any more Mickey Mouse stuff. We're, uh, we're going to go hit a place and there's probably going to be some shooting because they got armed guards. And if you don't really want to kill somebody, you'd probably better let us know so we can take you back home. And so uh, Gant told him he didn't really think he wanted to be involved in something like that, so they turned around and did take him home. By cooperating with the FBI, Sanders made a deal for his role in the illegal sale of the firearms and was put on probation. He was also finally dismissed as a third suspect in the bank robbery passing a lie detector test three times. With the help of Sanders' statement, Farley issued a federal warrant for Shannon Agofsky. He was indicted for transporting and selling firearms across state lines. Since Joe had not been involved in the sale, he was not charged. Authorities tracked down Shannon in a small town in Arkansas several months later. When apprehended, police searched his vehicle and found several bags of nickels in his trunk. Shannon was turned over to authorities in Missouri and booked in the Springfield Federal Courthouse. Look at me. Okay. While being processed, Farley acquired the set of Shannon's fingerprints examiners had been waiting for. The FBI lab needed a front and back view of his prints, hoping to match two partial prints found on the duct tape used in the murder of Dan Short. But his older brother, Joe, was still free, and Farley had little evidence to tie him to the crimes. Investigators knew the brothers remained in contact while Shannon was behind bars. Since all prison conversations were recorded, agents got a glimpse into the Agofskis' family relationship. Shannon made a number of calls to his mother and Joe. According to Assistant U.S. Attorney Mike Jones, one call was particularly yeah. incriminating. Uh, Shannon was asking Joe if uh, we would be able to make a case against him, and, and Joe indicated that we would not be able to put him uh, uh, at the scene. Farley knew the brothers were worried, but the call was not enough to arrest Joe. Then, just days later, he finally received the results from the lab. Those fingerprints turn out to be the fingerprints of Shannon Nagofsky. The tape was determined to have come from the chair in which Mr. Short was bound to. Therefore, that piece of tape became a most important piece of evidence in this case. Mike Jones now had a strong case against Shannon. We knew we were going to prosecute Shannon once we got those first two fingerprints, and then the main focus was on Joe trying to uh, get a case built against Joe. How's it going? Finding evidence against Joe was a thorny task. Nothing directly linked him to the crime. Once again, Farley combed through financial records to see how much Joe had spent. We attempted to determine all his cash transactions and did determine that he had spent some $19,000 in cash during the 16 months following the robbery. During that time, he was unemployed and had no logical explanation for having that much cash. Scrutinizing Joe's phone records, Farley made another important find. Joe had made several long-distance calls to his girlfriend at her home during the very days leading up to and after the robbery. 
Yeah. 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 The calls destroyed his alibi. Joe had stated that he was staying with her the entire time. Not too smart. They called Sanders in for additional questioning, hoping he could shed more light on Joe's involvement. Sanders told the agents about a conversation he had with both Lagofsky brothers. That incident took place in Sammy Skaggs' junkyard. The three of them were working on one of the cars, and uh, Sammy Skaggs announced that uh, the banker from Joplin was here to pick up his car. And that apparently generated a, a comment from, uh, I believe it was Joe, that uh, what the three of them ought to do was to uh, follow a banker, follow him home, uh, grab him, kidnap him, and force him to take him to the bank and open the vault. At the time, Sanders agreed that it might be an easy way to get rich. The plan sounded eerily like what could have happened to Dan Short. It was now clear to the FBI that the brothers had the knowledge, motive, and opportunity to pull off the homicide and heist. Based on accumulating evidence, Joe Ogofsky was arrested more than two years after the horrifying crime. Both brothers were indicted on three federal counts relating to the bank robbery and murder. But would the evidence be strong enough to convict the two brothers? The investigators were betting on it. Almost three years after a bank heist and brutal murder, FBI agent Liddell Farley handed prosecutors all the evidence the task force had amassed. Reviewing their files, the agents described the Agofsky's plans and actions to assistant U.S. attorney Mike Jones and his associates. They were determined to prove beyond any doubt that the brothers had committed the crime. The FBI had learned that Joe Agofsky, needing information about the state bank's floor plan, had opened a safe deposit box a few weeks before the crime. Bank Vice President Mark Ullman told investigators that Joe was particularly interested in Dan Short as well. He made a point of asking who Short was and where he lived. He's our president. Would you like to meet him? Oh, no, thanks. I was just asking who he was. Returning home, Joe drew floor plans to the bank and plotted the crime with Shannon. They decided to do the job before the sun rose so there would be no witnesses. Get you there, I want you guys to knock the cameras out. Okay, to get into the vault, knock. they needed someone who had the keys and knew the combination. Make sure get them keys. For that, they would abduct Dan Short, the bank president, and force him to open the vault. Afterwards, they needed to make sure he'd never talk. Short, don't get that combination up. They Crush thought it would be easy money. Life would be good with their new fortunes. Let's get these guns clean. Let's get... In the early hours of October 6th, Joe and Shannon Agofsky put their plan into motion. Acting as a lookout for them was an unidentified accomplice who drove the blue Chevy pickup. It was the same vehicle neighbor Carol Dryden recalled seeing around Short's house a week before the kidnapping. The brothers loaded their mother's brown and tan van with the equipment they would need to commit the crime. At around 2 a.m., they arrived at Dan Short's house, a brief trip across the Arkansas border. Eventually, he awoke from a deep sleep. The intruders would be the last people he ever saw. Short tried to flee. He had no chance against the brothers and their accomplice. They threatened to kill him unless he turned over his keys to the bank. Silencing him, the intruders dragged Short outside. The terror continued as Short was stuffed into the front seat of the van.
Each criminal drove one of the vehicles, including Short's red pickup as they sped off for the bank. Agent Farley and the prosecutors continued piecing together the events of October 6th. The Agofskis and their accomplice pulled up to the bank, only a brief drive from Short's house. With their captive in tow, the robbers quickly opened the bank's front door and ran in. No alarm sounded because Short had neglected to set them, and no one would ever be able to see what was about to happen. Go, let's go to that desk. Who's After that desk? ripping the duct tape off his mouth, they pulled Short over to his desk Who's and retrieved desk? the keys to the safe. Then they forced him to provide right. the vault's combination. Hurry up, Only two right. So. Once inside, they grabbed all that was in reach. Get him out! Get out! Get and out. dashed away. Go! I'll blow your head off! Move it! They dumped the loot in the truck. Afraid for his life, Short complied with their every demand. But the assailants pistol whipped him and knocked him out. On the way out of Noel, Buddy Mills crossed paths with the brothers. After he passed the intersection, the three vehicles sped off, the first two heading toward Grand Lake. Reaching Grand Lake, some 22 miles from Noel, the two remaining vehicles stopped along the high point of the Cowskin Bridge. Here, Shannon and the unknown accomplice prepared to kill Short by drowning him. In his haste, Shannon took off his gloves to secure a portion of the tape. Shut up! And unknowingly stop. left greasy fingerprints behind. Then the two attached the stolen chain hoist. I'll do anything. Anything you want. When they finished, they lifted short above the lake. Oh, no! No! And plunged him into the black water below. At the first trial in September 1992, the evidence was strong enough to persuade a jury to convict Shannon and Joe Agofsky of three federal crimes relating to the robbery, abduction, and use of firearms during the illegal acts. In the state trial, only Shannon was found guilty of murder. Though the unidentified accomplice was never found, it was determined that the Agofsky brothers were the masterminds and principal perpetrators of the crime. No charges were brought against their mother, Sheila. Without doubt, this was the most difficult investigation I've been involved in as an FBI agent. Some 29 years of investigating various crimes. This was a, an unusually heinous crime. Today, Joe and Shannon Agofsky are serving life sentences with no chance of parole. For his cooperation, Gant Sanders served the remainder of his firearms charge on probation. Noel has returned to normal, a violent chapter in its history now closed. Yet because of the crimes of these blood brothers, it will never be the same quiet, innocent place it once was. <laughs>